Uh, our next plenary session is from the Anti-Poverty Centre. Um, this is their panel. Um, I'll introduce uh, Jen in a minute to come up and, and uh, run the panel. But um, the Anti-Poverty Centre was established by welfare recipients to counter problems with policy-making approaches and actors who harm or marginalise the, the people that they perform to help. Um, and so they conceive of the current policy ecosystem and those who operate within it as forming a poverty machine. Fundamental to the machine is an entrenched belief that welfare recipients do not have the answers to the challenges that people face. Um, the Anti-Poverty Centre seeks to ensure the voices and rights of people on the lowest incomes are at the centre of social policy development and discourse moving to an approach that prioritises trust and agency for people who rely on settling payments to live. Today's panel is an invitation and it's a challenge to academics and others involved in social policy to engage in critical self-reflection. And I have the honour of introducing the plenary panel session being run by the Anti Poverty Centre. distinction. 
What we're talking about is expertise. We are a panel of experts, and we are here to challenge your notions of positionality, the value of the knowledge um, that conventional researchers extract from poor people, and how that profits you and your institutions. So, without any more from me, I'm very excited to introduce Mel. Mel Fisher is a welfare advocate and public housing tenant from South Australia, and she is currently living on the job seeker payment, and I forgot to bring the mic with me, so I'm now going to take her. <laughs>
So a lot of people, when I think of poverty, I think of resilience. I like to say it builds character because remember, we like that. They gloss over the fact that it's traumatising and soul destroying, that it wears you down over and over again. It leaves you hopeless and afraid to try in case you waste any resources and fail. The fear of failure is real. Nobody chooses poverty. Poverty makes you hopeless and without hope you give up on yourself. Ask any of us that what our goals and our dreams are because I promise you we all have them. We just don't have the resources to see it through. Yet often we are completely left out of this conversation that directly impacts us. We don't get a seat at the table. The truth is we have the expertise and we know what we need to better our situation. By leaving us out of the conversation, we end up with policies that impact us but are not helpful to us. Policies that harm us and take away our agency. And each one of us that sometimes gets seen, seen as a case study into poverty has a story. And a reason why we've ended up in poverty. We're not just statistics, we are the experts in poverty. Thank you, Mel. Um, I was worried you weren't going to have any time for questions, but you were so concise that we do have time for questions for you. I'll probably just take one or two now if there are any, um, and hopefully we'll have time for a couple more after Jane and Mel Carson have spoken. So did anyone have a question for Mel Fisher? Yes. Hi Mel, I'm Matt. Um, you spoke about having dream, uh, I think you said dreams um, and um, hopes. Could you say a little bit about your dreams and hopes are? So I actually, <laughs> so I actually adore art. I'm pretty good at it, I would say. Um, and I have signed up hopefully to get in for next year for graphic design at okay? TAFE. Um, that's what I hope, my dream. I, I don't want to be, nobody wants to be a welfare. And for people to say, like, we often hear that they do, and I believe it's more a self-esteem issue, where people are too scared to try and can say they fail. So, like, yeah, I want to do graphic design, I want to freelance, I, and I want to make a life for myself. Thank you, Mel. And did I have any more questions? It's okay because I have one if no one else does. Okay. Um, no, I just was wondering, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but you were chatting to me the other day just about your own self perception and, and what you were thinking about poverty a couple of years ago versus what you think about it now and some of your reflections now. I wonder if you could talk a bit about what changed that. Yes. So, a few years ago, especially when I was on the care inspection, I thought, well, I deserve welfare. I'm taking care of my mother. I'm taking care of my brother. I deserve this payment. And when I went on to job seeker, I started realising everybody deserves this payment. Everybody deserves support. And my situation, I'm disabled, so I get that you're deserving of help and yet my friends who are not disabled but may have mental health or low self-esteem which really does affect people will get you don't deserve it you're a double agent so my perception completely changed once i was on job seeker and i saw the difference in the way we were both treated me and my friends so i think that's very important because every single person deserves support in a country as wealthy as australia Thank you.
your attention to this wonderful quote from Thomas Students, who is a welfare advocate, um, currently gainfully employed, I think not a job seeker at the moment, but you may, if you followed um, RoboDev coverage on Twitter, you might have seen Tom's incredible citizen journalism, and he's participated in some of the work that Jay is about to talk about, and my, <laughs> there's uh, many nuggets of genius that come out of Tom, but I love this one, uh, it really stood out to me, it says, welfare policy is not rocket science, we should stop treating it that way, so that's something I would really love all of you to reflect on, while Jay uh, makes his way up here. Um, so Jay is a social policy researcher and co-coordinator at the Anti-Poverty Centre, he's from Victoria and he's currently on our study, um, doing his tourist doctor at RMIT. Material 
supports. This isn't a wicked problem, it's a choice, and the benefit, uh, the benefit for people was realised in 2020 when some payments were essentially lifted to citizens and public land. The structures we have in place now uh, offer none of this, or any form of natural justice, whether that be in relation to centering payments or employment services. The erosion of community justice over the years has caused unpaid activists to offer peer support, whether individually or through groups like the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, who offer their advocacy line for free by volunteers. Doing this has built solidarity among unemployed people and the confidence to know that none of us are deserving poor. The approach we took to our recent report, uh, Punishment for Profit, is underpinned by the belief that the subject of this cruel system are the ones who should be leading to break it down and build something better. The methodology we are evolving is designed to firstly demonstrate an alternative approach to policy making that is led by unemployed and low income people. Second is to start from first principles by considering the basis on which past and current programs were founded before exploring new questions and generating proposals. And the third, uh, identifying straightforward solutions where they exist and devise a number of programs and approaches to thinking about and providing support for those who want them. So just to finish up, our work is about building confidence and capacity, liberation, and to not only change current structures, but to understand them, communicate, and navigate them in order to make collective change. This is community building, by giving people the capacity to advocate and organise and take agency back. It's a slow progress, but it has to start somewhere. So by pushing for change within your institutions and in your own work, you can contribute to the project Social Change is Social Policy. Um, but she has done it in a really deep and meaningful 
way. Um, we're very grateful that she's the co-convener of the anti poverty Centre because we wanted um, to have our committee be um, comprised for of people who could provide support and use their own resources to partner and to build the capacity of people who are welfare recipients wanting to learn how to do things like Bellman and Incorporated Association, very exciting stuff like that. So um, academics have invited us to do guest lectures. Um, one of our major issues, and Kathleen Lanigan, is right here, from the table to speak to one of Kathleen's classes, I think, last year. Um, so, <laughs> thank you, Kathleen. Um, and Alice Payne, who was there with me um, to give that presentation, who isn't here today. But I think what we're doing is we're trying to do something novel. And what we want to do is demonstrate that to all of you. That means we are very stretched with our capacity. We want to expand the number of people involved in that work so there are more people who can do that with you. We are unfunded and we don't let people work for free for us. Uh, they and I work for free, but people who contribute to our work don't. So our ability to grow is, is slowly increasing, but it's taking time. What we would love to see is a world in which um, conventional researchers, people in academic institutions, see it as their job to make sure that people outside those institutions are not just centred, I think that word is overused um, and is a crutch, um, but given respect as a leader. And so there's a long, long way to go with that, and I'd love to talk to my folks about it over the next day or so, um, because we have another very important talk that is directly related to that question um, from Mel Power Smith, and I'm just going to go up and put on this amazing slide that Mel has got. Uh, Um, so, I'm going to introduce Mel now. Mel Powell Smith is um, a PhD researcher and a casually employed uh, person at the University of Queensland. She is also, uh, like myself, on the disability support pension, um, which for those of you who know what the income free area means and what take rates are, it's really fun to be a casual worker. Um, <laughs> and on a welfare payment that's not enough to live on. Um, so, Mel is going to share uh, our. Yeah, you can, you can uh, share her expertise about being at the intersection of academia and the welfare system. Oh, hello everyone and thank you for coming. Um, I'd like you to enjoy the ambience of a Brisbane working class stranghold. Um, this is me and my name Chris. And on our t-shirts it says, just your average public housing enjoyer. And he's literally, or well, he mostly enjoys it. There's a few and I, I sort of enjoy it in theory. Um, I grew up in it. Um, anyway, so my name's Mel Powersmith, and I'm a PhD student researching how tenants experience a sense of home in social housing under tenure residualisation, as well as the residualisation in the welfare state more broadly. Now, this term is a welfare term, it's been around for a while and it's most often applied to housing, but it can also apply to other welfare services <coughs> like schools, the child safety system. So it sort of encompasses a program of extreme targeting, poor quality services and the stigmatisation of uh, many beneficiaries. So today I'm going to talk about the relationship between first-hand experience, research and policy. Beyond my dissertational research, I have first-hand experience of these residual last resort programs. So I'm on a very partial pension that gets income tested down. And look, I'm better off than many people, but it's still hard. So. This is the first time in my life I've actually enjoyed some form of status. I mean, people would still be at me for being on the pension. And so it's a bit of an adjustment, like I feel a bit posh. <laughs> you know, standing here at Electon. Um, I've been devalued for not having a job in the past and being on welfare. Um, and people sort of expect people on welfare, they have this weird sort of, contradictory thing, like they expect us to get a job and 
we're so passive, but when we advocate for ourselves, not that kind of active, you can't be like that. <laughs> um, and we get attacked for acting above our station um, and, you know, fighting the hand that feeds us. Um, so I'm also in the position where I've got peers who come from a similar background to me and they've reacted negatively to my achievements because they're jealous and they think that I think I'm better than them, which is not the case. I think that they should have more money and we should have more unity and we've been turned against each other. Um, so we're all out of each other. I mean, they should be looking at the top at the people who are responsible for this mess. So, and I have other people who, you know, who I've lived with in social housing who are really proud of me for making it into my PhD. Um, so I straddled two worlds of being an academic and being a person who has real experience of poverty and marginalisation. Um, I've also been a research participant and now I'm starting to conduct research of my own. So I can sort of combine all of those in, um, experiences and insights in what I'm doing. So here's um, my little poverty story. So prior to the, this work, um, I came from what social scientists have called the lumpen proletariat, or what Nicholas Rose calls the residuum. Um, and just <laughs> 10 years ago, I was on the job agency um, homelessness circuit in Brisbane. Um, job agencies do nothing to help people build their capacities and human capital in most cases. And all you have to do is look at all of the testimonies of other people who've experienced the same. They make you do pointless, busy work, uh, bullshit courses, and instill a, a deep sense of despair in claimants. Um, so I was put in a course by Serena Russo, and they received generous funding from the government to, and I had to do a unit, and they asked me to put the numbers one to 10 in numerical order. Um, and I could never improve my mental health, for which it was affected by the way I grew up in, in sort of spending time in foster care and, and so on. So it just, it, it's just a place that sort of intensifies mental illness and the constant threat of having my payments removed just put me in, you know, constant tension. So I hope I've permanently exited this sphere. But I'll tell you about one particular day. I was homeless, sleeping on a piece of foam in the laundry room of a man who I met in the mental health ward. We decided to go to the beach and we were both on the dole. We put $20 worth of fuel in the car and when we got there, we were hungry. So we went to the fish and chip shop and we couldn't afford a meal. So we waited until these people got up and left the table and they left a bunch of chips and I needed eaten stuff there and we got into it. And this woman was like, oh, I would never do that. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you never had to do something like that. And unfortunately, a lot of policy is coming from the perspective of people who've never had to choose between such crap choices. So, yeah, when policy is being constructed from the perspectives of advantaged people, there's a risk of exploitation, exclusion, and misrepresenting the voices of people with direct experience. For example, I'm um, being taken off the Queensland social housing wait list because their income limit is $609 per week, and that has remained unchanged since 2006. Um, that's below the Henderson poverty line. Um, I'm on, so I sort of almost make it up to like the minimum wage, but I still think people on the minimum wage should be eligible for public housing because look at how unaffordable things are. And there's other factors like disability, the 
as well. So I wrote a letter to Megan Scanlon. Let's see, she's the housing minister in Queensland. I doubt I'll get a response. Um, so I'll just have to make it through with this crappy um, private rental sharing. Um, so yeah, all, all the knowledge comes from a perspective. Even people who purport to be detached and to be objective. Um, I came from a background where I was discredited and everything that I said was subjected to more scrutiny because I was a malingerer or, a, you know. Um, and I want to talk to you about having participated in research before that was an extractive process. So a bunch of research participants, including myself, were, there was a launch, so it was a big project. They had photographers and ministers. We were ignored like lumps, and they were greeting each other and talking to each other, and just like, yeah. And throughout the process, I got to know the other participants, and they became quite alienated because the researcher sort of posed as a lived experience researcher, but really, he had an episode, and he was back enjoying his middle class lifestyle and you know, looking forward to a career. And not only that, um, I sort of told him about my misgivings and they offered me unpaid work um, to transcribe the interviews. And I just ghosted them. <laughs> I'd never do, I would never do that. <laughs> yeah. So we need to have people who have a range of experiences helping to produce research and the participants need to be, re to, to be treated as our partners and even co-researchers. I think that people who are new to the field of academia can bring new angles to the research and that's where I've gotten sort of the ideas that shape my own research endeavours from. So people with um, actual experiences of poverty and other kinds of marginalisation and adversity can act as intermediaries between the worlds of research and academia and the everyday worlds of those living on the margins. I feel like these work, the rift between these worlds is getting bigger. I think by acting, working in unison, we can help to make visible what is, ex, what is um, obscured. Right now, um, yeah, what, hap what happens, like ontologically, what happens when the social sciences are dominated by people who come from private schools or who own multiple properties? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm sure you can still be a good person, but just... <laughs>
um, for so it was a diverse conference. There were academics, there were social policy people, there were support workers, um, and we were given little dots and told if you conceive of yourself as someone with lived experience, put a dot there, and if you're involved in service provision, put a dot there. I cannot have been the only person in that room who was both. Um, or who was both, and it was really jarring to have that binarism shoved into our face. So I was wondering, and I, I can understand why you would make a choice, like very, you would re repress it because it's shameful or painful or whatever, and you're in a room with colleagues and you know what colleagues think. Um, but I wonder if, if it seems to me like it's you've You've described it in academia, I've experienced it in the social policy space and the support service space. Do they, does that kind of thing sound the same to what you were articulating about academia, or is, can you see them being kind of specific to the different institutions? Like, I'm just kind of wondering about that because I can see parallels. Thank you, Camille. So, yeah, it's, it, I think. I mean, and, and I think it, almost all of us have experienced some sort of adversity. Um, I just, I find from like my own experiences, I mean, I go to a, a sandstone university, so it just seems to be more sort of affluent people. But yeah, there's definitely people in academia who've been through. Um, Challenges and I find, um, yeah, it's not binary really. I mean, our identities are shifting all the time, and I have to reflect on the fact that maybe, I mean, it's wobbly at the moment. I'm dealing with insecure um, accommodation, but maybe one day I'll be comfortable. But I don't, I don't want to leave other people behind. Like, I want to make sure that the ladder is down, it doesn't get pulled up. You know, I, I'd like to be paying my taxes one day so that other people can have a chance to live. Yeah, that's it's sort of the motivator behind what I do. I, I, I don't know if I, that's kind of a dithery answer. <laughs> Maybe because things aren't binary. <laughs> um, okay, so I uh, have these questions all through them, but instead <laughs> of me taking up the space, we have a few more minutes. Um, so is there anyone else who wanted to ask a question of anyone or all of us? I'm going to be that um, weirdo that kind of shares a story rather than asks a question. Somebody put it up front. My name is Liz Allen and I I have lived experience of what you talk about. And I'm going to look at you because I'm not going to look at them. Okay. Resilience is for the privileged. We are told too often that we must be resilient, we must pick ourselves up as we exit after out of home care and so on and navigate homelessness, mental health, teen parenthood and the like. It's a rush. I'm in academia by accident and I don't know how I got here and I think it's purely luck, right? And I exactly feel how you feel, straddling two worlds but never fitting in one, so we fall through the gap. I still experience housing insecurity. It's rubbish, but I'm no different to that. And so what I want to say to you is that you have experts of your lived experience in places agitating for change. We are still not listened to. It is a frustrating endeavour but together, we will make it happen. We've, I've not forgotten where I've come from. I still navigate that world. Be brave and don't listen to the bastards who tell you to do this. Yeah. Open No, keep going. Keep going. 
media interviews as well. Um, I've also written for The Guardian about poverty and how it affects me. Um, the Guardian is great, they give us a voice, but in other interviews, after they've gone to print, I found I've been called a dog blunder. How dare she dye her hair? How dare she be overweight? Now, I also want to quickly touch on that because I think it's very important that we break down some barriers. I'm overweight. I'm also, I also got diagnosed with scurvy and malnutrition because I can afford the cheap food, but I can't afford the good food. So it's pasta and it's bread and it's everything I shouldn't be eating. And I find like people, so many people went comments saying, well, she's fat, she eats a lot. And I'm like, it's nothing to do with that. So because of the scurvy and the malnutrition, I have a skin condition that also causes uh, infections that hospitalise me. Poverty is killing me. Slowly. I've been in hospital that many times that the doctors don't know what to do anymore. It's antibody after antibody after antibody. I, I'm home for maybe a month and then back to hospital because it's happened again. I had to wait two years for a dermatologist appointment because I couldn't afford to go private. <coughs> I'm finally in with a public health dermatologist after two years. And I can't help but think the cost to Medicare because of poverty. We could save so much in that kind of cost, but instead we would rather punish people. So I think we need to build trust, we need to help each other and push for better for people. Thank you. Thank you. 